Welcome. If you're a guest or a visitor, the last uh, couple of weeks I've been over in East Africa visiting my son, his family, and had a great time there. And one of the purposes was to drill one of our Bear Creek water wells in Kenya. And we actually went to a, a town kind of northeast of Nairobi, um, or actually northwest of Nairobi over by the Uganda border on Lake Victoria. And we've got some pictures, I think, behind me here that will show that, that well that was being drilled. But uh, we had a great time in uh, starting this well, and it's now completed. And in case you're not familiar with this, Bear Creek Water recycles bottles and cans. We use that money, and we partner with Living Water International and drilling drinking water wells in developing countries. And this is well number 97. And this well here is in a little town called Butere, uh, which is uh, not too far from Lake Victoria. And it's on the school grounds of St. Peter's Christian Girls School. And all the wells that we drill are either at a Christian school site or on a church site. So the Christian leaders there can uh, kind of monitor and maintain that well. In some countries, uh, when you uh, drill a well, some bad guys will come and kind of commandeer the well and charge people money to get the water, even though they didn't drill it. And so Bear Creek Water and Living Water International partner together to make sure that a community of Christians is over that well and controlling it and making it free water to anyone that needs water. So in this little community of, of Butere, there are about uh, 600 girls who go to the school, St. Peter's Christian School. And then in the broader little community around there, there are another uh, 400 people that live there. And up until this well that we drilled last week, if you lived in that community, you would have to take a, a water bucket or a big water uh, can container, about three to five gallons. You'd have to walk a kilometer and a half down to the river. You'd have to fill your uh, container up with water and then walk a kilometer and a half back to your site or your home or to the school. And you do that uh, you know, all day long. And unfortunately, in a lot of developing countries, women get charged with the task of carrying the water. And it's time consuming. It keeps young girls from going to school and getting their education. And so the beauty of providing a well is that it's right there in the middle of the community. It's free to the school and to the people in that community. And it saves about 1,000 people from having to go and make that three kilometer round trip every day, several days just to have uh, water. Plus, this is good, clean drinking water, and the water in the river is not uh, good at all. In fact, a lot of diseases that children get and sometimes die from is because they're drinking dirty uh, river water or even uh, out of a spring that, that's dirty. So it was a great time uh, being with my son and his family. Uh, it was a great time to have my son with me as we participated in drilling uh, that well. Living Water International is a great organization, works in 20 plus countries, and they have these rigs, these drilling rigs in each of their countries. And uh, we hit water at about 60 meters, and then they went down another 60 meters and found a large reservoir of water. And that well is now producing 7,000 liters per hour of water that will go on for, for many, many years. So thank you so much. <clears throat> because your recycling provided the resources, the money we needed to drill that well over there in Kenya. And without your support and involvement, uh, none of that would have really happened. So uh, thank you so much. And let me just challenge you. You know, many of you still, after all these years, this is, we've been doing Bear Creek Water now for nine years. Some of you still don't recycle. You know, it's not hard. It's very easy, and so I drank a lot of b bottled water while I was gone, and I had my suitcase with a lot of uh, empty plastic water bottles. And you know, security is so tight now, when you go through uh, security, um, regardless of whether it's going into the other country or coming back in our country, they uh, often look into your baggage and they leave a little card that says the security people opened up your luggage and looked inside and da 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 da. And I've always wanted to be able to see one of these security guys unzipping my suitcase and opening it up and looking for heroin or, or some drug. And instead, he sees all these plastic water bottles. 
And I'm wondering, what does that guy think when he looks in my suitcase and sees plastic water bottles? What kind of guy is bringing that back into the country? Well, it's legal. You can bring them back. But thank you so much uh, for your involvement in helping us. If you haven't started recycling, start recycling. And then every Sunday we have teams of people that take the recycling that we gather all week from uh, four different schools and a bunch of different businesses and locations in Stockton and in Lodi. And uh, they crush it and put it in containers that we take to the recycling center during the week. And then we get that money cashed in, which allows us to drill the wells. So if you haven't started recycling, please do that. You can drop it off at the recycling center right next to the tent. And you can also get involved on one Sunday a month. It involves about an hour, hour and a half of just crushing the cans and bottles, putting them in those containers. And uh, we need more help with our teams. And we only ask you to serve one service one Sunday a month. And you can go to the other service. You can serve at 9 or serve at 11. And uh, we definitely need your help in that area. So if you want to uh, get involved, there's a table in the lobby with someone there, and they can answer all your questions about that. While I was in um, Kenya last week, it reminded me of how important it is to go on mission trips. And many of you have. Uh, we do mission trips every year. Every other year we go to Israel. Uh, this summer we're going to Mexico in early July, and we're going to El Salvador uh, July 29th through August 7th. And if you've never gone, you really need to go. Um, I need to go on mission trips. In fact, for the last 40 years, I've gone on a mission trip probably at least once a year. Because the Bible tells us to go in all the world, preach the gospel to the whole world. And we have a big world. You know, there are 192 countries in the world. There are 54 countries just in the continent of Africa. It's a big world. And sometimes we stay in our little bubble here, you know, in San Joaquin County. We just stay in our little bubble, and we, we never leave the bubble. But we need to realize it's a big world, and God loves the whole world, all 192 countries. And so if you've never gone on a trip, boy, this would be the great time this summer for you to consider uh, getting involved. Again, just go to guest services and uh, let them know of your interest, and uh, they'll answer all your questions. Let's just pause and uh, pray for our 97 wells that are providing clean drinking water for over 62,000 children and families all over the world. Just pray with me. Father, we thank you for this idea that really kind of percolated in Ann Pacheco's heart and life nine years ago. Thank you that we have this ability to recycle and gives money that allows us to drill these wells. Bless each location of these 97 wells. And as people come for the physical water that helps life, May they also find the spiritual water of life through Jesus Christ. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a guest or a visitor, we're in a series called Road Trip. And we've all been on a road trip. You know, maybe it's packing the kids up in the family van and going off for a couple of days. Or a road trip may last a week or maybe sometimes even a month to going from one place to another. And this past week, I was thinking about my past and maybe some road trips I had gone on. And I was thinking back to my summer after I graduated from college. I went on a road trip with 39 other guys. And we didn't use cars, and we didn't use trucks, we didn't use buses, and we didn't use motorcycles, but we did use 10-speed Schwinn Supersport bicycles. And we did a road trip from Miami, Florida to Seattle, Washington. And we zigzagged across the country, and you can't drive your bike on interstate highways, so you had to take 
secondary roads. And as we drove and rode across uh, America on bicycles, we stopped in little towns across America and had the opportunity to share Jesus with people along the way. And that was a, a great road trip. But as I was thinking of another road trip I took <clears throat> when I, was, I had just graduated from high school. And I was 17. I remember going to my dad. My dad was a, a Christian man. He was a businessman. He wasn't a, a pastor. I said, Dad, you know, I'm graduating from high school, and I want to be stuck in college for the next four years. I'd like to do something really exciting. Can my buddy and I uh, go down to Latin America, and can we hitchhike through Latin America? And my dad said, sure, son. You want to do that? Go for it. So I remember, you know, we got down to Miami, and we flew a DC-3 from Miami over to the Yucatan Peninsula of, of Mexico. And for those of you under 40, uh, back then a DC-3 was one of the common uh, airline planes uh, that was used. It had uh, an engine on each wing. It was a very loud, noisy uh, engine. And we flew across uh, the Caribbean there, and we landed in um, that part of Mexico. And then we hitchhiked down through Guatemala and uh, Honduras and Nicaragua, and then came back up through what was then British Honduras, which is now called Belize. And uh, we had just a, a great time. And you know, we didn't have cell phones back in those days. And my, my dad had no idea where I was. He didn't even know what country I would be in at any given time. And when my, I have three sons, and when my sons learned that their dad had done that, they each came up to me and said, Dad, can we do what you did? And I said, no, sons, you're not, you're not, it was good for dad, it's not good for you. But of course, it's a whole different world uh, back then. And we hitchhiked through those, those countries. And again, if you're under, under 40, you didn't, probably don't know this, but back in the old days, a common mode of transportation was hitchhiking. You'd just stand on the side of the road, hold your thumb up, and a truck or a car would stop and pick you up and give you a ride for such and such a space and time. And I was thinking of that trip, how there were a couple of times when we went some places we probably shouldn't have gone, and we rode with some people we probably shouldn't have uh, ridden with, and as I look back on it, uh, there were warning signs and signals, not painted on a sign, but there were things that uh, you probably shouldn't do that, and we did it anyways, and it was only by the grace of God that uh, this 17-year-old uh, survived that, that summer and went on w with his life. And on, remember, on one occasion, we were in Nicaragua, and this truck, this big truck stopped and, and picked us up, and we got in the back, and there were a bunch of uh, soldiers in the back of this truck, and they were guerrilla soldiers, anti-government uh, uh, Contra guys. And as I think back, you know, that probably wasn't a good thing to have done since we didn't know the language even hardly at all. And making wrong, going into wrong places and, and running stop signs and going through uh, places you shouldn't go is something we, we've all done in the past. And yet, we need to realize that God is absolutely obsessed with lost people. And the Bible teaches all about this. And this idea of making a wrong turn and a wrong choice is beautifully illustrated by a story in Luke chapter 15, where Jesus really tells three stories that have the same uh, intent to all three. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 15 in your program or some notes and, and take those notes out. Let me add something parenthetically, that Jesus was a master storyteller. He told some amazing stories. In fact, most of Jesus' teachings take the form of a story. In the Bible, they're called parables. And parables are simply a story with a purpose or a, a meaning attached to them. And Jesus was a masterful storyteller. Uh, he would speak to 5,000 men plus women and children without a microphone. And they, they could all hear him. And it, it was just, just amazing how he did that and was able to capture people's attention in that setting. And one of the most depressing things for people that are in my business, you know, preachers, is that studies have shown that most people who hear a sermon on Sunday morning will have forgotten 90% of it by midnight tonight. And when you think about all the hours we spend in making a sermon and to think that it's forgotten by midnight, 
except if two things happen. One exception is if you take notes and write things down. That's why we give you notes every Sunday to write things down so you can review them. You remember it if you take notes and review those notes. And you also have a greater ability to remember if you hear a good story. And that's why Jesus told so many good stories throughout his teachings here in the earth. And when we stand up here to teach, we're really not trying to, we don't want to entertain you. It's not about entertaining. Um, it's not about getting you to hoop and holler and say, amen, preacher brother, and, and, and all of that and encouragement. It's not about that, really. It's really about us being able to take God's word and teach it in a way that goes into your brain first and then drops down into your heart so that you get the word of God that becomes a heart-transforming agent in your life and in your very being. That, that's the purpose of this 30-minute uh, part of our, our church service. And that's why we try to follow the teaching pattern of Jesus. We want to unpack the Word of God. We want to tell a good story that will illustrate that point so it gets into your heart. And in Luke chapter 15, many of you, in fact, most of you are probably familiar with the story of the prodigal son. And the other two stories that Jesus told are a little less familiar, but they all have the same point. And the point is this. God is obsessed about lost things. God is obsessed with lost people. And if the church ever loses sight of this biblical fact, that the church is here principally to reach lost people, if we lose sight of that truth as our number one priority, in time the church will go out of business. That's why yesterday our ministry outreach 55 was just down here three miles from where you're seated, Loch Lomond Park, Acapulco Way, Section 8 housing right there. And we had 55, or we had 66 volunteers. We served 350 families, gave out 175 bags of groceries. Two people uh, committed their life to Christ. Just yesterday, in that community, three miles from where you're seated, and we do that because that's the primary mandate of the Church of Jesus Christ. And we must never lose sight of that fact. Now, worship is important. We believe the Bible teaches that God's people should worship him. And we invest a lot of our resources, our time and a service, and energy in a service to do worship. But if we only do worship and lose sight of the priority of reaching lost people, in time, if we're just about a worshiping church and we're not about reaching lost people, in time the church will go out of, bus out of business. Because the primary mandate of the church is to reach lost people. We believe in prayer. Our church has been built on prayer. We give a lot of energy and resources and time to prayer. We think prayer is really important. But if you only pray and lose sight of the fact that the number one priority of the church is to reach lost people, in time, the church will go out of business. Because the mandate of the church is to reach lost people because God, the Father, is obsessed with reaching lost people. And this story here in Luke chapter 15 illustrates that wonderful truth so clearly for us. The last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven were the words, go into all of the world, the whole world. It's a big world, 192 countries in our world today. Go into all the world and communicate the gospel to people. That's the mandate of the church. And Jesus begins Luke 15 by telling three stories. And he's addressing a particular audience. And in Luke chapter 15, the first two verses of that chapter, it says that Jesus was teaching to notorious sinners and tax collectors. That was the first group tax collectors. April 15th, just a few days ago, you know, you send it in, probably with a check. You know, I, I hear people get, re, get money back from their income tax. I can never remember getting any money back. Why am I always paying uh, Uncle Sam and the, I never get my money back? You know, I, I must be in that wrong income tax bracket or something, but in Jesus' days, the tax collectors were Jewish people 
who worked for the Roman government, and if someone's tax was $50, these tax collectors would charge $100, give Rome the 50, and pocket the other 50. They were, they were crooked. They were evil guys. They were notorious sinners. So in the audience, Jesus says there were notorious sinners there, and there were also religious people, religious people, these people who kept the Ten Commandments. They knew all ten. They kept them to the letter of the law. But they were just as lost as the notorious sinners because their hearts were hard. See, it's not about keeping the Ten Commandments. It is about keeping a soft heart that's sensitive to God and his word. That's why Jesus said in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save people that are lost because God is obsessed with lost people. And these three stories are all interconnected and tell us that when someone is lost and that someone is found, that God has a party. God has a party in heaven. And these three stories uh, perfectly illustrate that. So it doesn't matter what wrong turn you've made or what uh, illegal U-turn you've made. Last Sunday after our second service, somebody made an illegal U-turn coming out of our parking lot and caused an accident. You know, we, we've made uh, bad mistakes. We've all made bad choices. We've all made wrong turns. Uh, we've all violated when the sign said stop. We went through it. And yet we need to realize that when that happens, God the Father is there, and he delights in finding us and bringing us back to himself. Now, I think sometimes when we go through the wrong turn and we make the wrong turn and we go uh, the wrong way down a one-way street, I think we need to remind ourselves that God's view on us is very special and very precious. And if we keep that in our minds, it'll keep us from going down those wrong paths. So in your notes, I want to share three things with you this morning about what the prodigal son forgot and what we need to remember as well. And the first is this. I think we forget, the prodigal son forgot, that he was so cherished by God. He was cherished by God. In these three stories, that shepherd cherished that one lost sheep. The lady with ten coins cherished the one lost silver coin that she couldn't find. And the father who had the prodigal son, he cherished the fact that his son had gone out and abandoned his values in his life and was waiting for him to turn. Let's look at the shepherd. You know, the shepherd did something totally illogical. The shepherd left the 99 sheep. He left them unprotected, unguided, and he went and looked for the one little lost woolly lamb that had wandered off and gotten in trouble. And when he found the lamb, he probably picked that little lamb up, carried him back, put him back in the sheep pen, went inside his house, fired up his laptop, went to his you know, Excel spreadsheet, and added one more asset, one more sheep to his count there, so he had it all there. And then he probably sent out a group text to all of his buddies. He said, come on, we're going to have a barbecue. Come over, my lost sheep has been found, and come over, let's have a big barbecue. I've always wondered, what did he barbecue? Did he barbecue that lost sheep, you know? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But that one sheep was cherished by the shepherd. And he, he left the 99 just to go and find the one. And you are cherished by God. You matter so much to God. God's crazy about you. He, he loves you. And even when we take a wrong turn, and we all have, we need to know that he is there for us. Look in your notes. In Hebrews 13, 5, the Bible says that God tells us, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. We need to remember how much we're cherished by God. And I've asked one of our young men, David uh, Risewood, to come on up here. And I've asked Dave to come and just share uh, a little bit about his life story and how God has uh, brought him back to himself. Now, in the first service, this was the first time David was up here talking, so now it's the second time you've been up here, so you should be really comfortable, cool, calm, and collected, and share with us, David. I kind of feel like Elvis now. You know, a little bit. I just 
can't sing like him, and I'm not shaking my hips up here either. So, um, he talks about Pastor Bill talks about the lost sheep. Um, I can relate to that because that was me um, a little over a year ago. Uh, my name is David Reiswood. I'm a grateful and faithful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with lust, anger, anxiety, depression, and addiction. You name it, I struggled with it. Um, I was very blessed athletically as a, as a youngster and uh, as through high school, as well as scholastically. But I didn't realize what the opportunity God had given me, and I just I threw all that away. Um, regretfully, at the age of 16, uh, I went to my first party, took my first drink of alcohol. By the age of 18, I had been charged with my first DUI. And by 26, I was abusing drugs. Um, by 2005, I was married with two children and going through an extremely difficult divorce. And yes, those two children, that's you, Austin and Deanna, they're out there right now. Um, turning to drugs as a way of coping with that, um, I suffered a heart attack at the age of 31 in 2007, in which I spent uh, five days in the hospital, three days in ICU. Doctors told me if I ever used it again, it would probably cost me my life. I think I'd listen. After being clean and sober for five years, I was remarried, uh, had two homes, uh, four beautiful children, uh, and life was good, so I thought. Still a non-believer, drinking and selfishly abusing drugs, again, behind my wife's back. I had quickly become unfaithful to myself, to my wife, to my children, and to my entire family. I was deeply in trouble. My life was spiraling out of control. I felt as if the devil was in me. Um, just felt like he was in, inside of me. And he was just controlling me. On October 28, 2016, suffering from uh, severe depression, addiction, anxiety, and anger, I made my first attempt to commit suicide, in which I was admitted into Fremont Hospital in Fremont um, on a 5150 suicide watch. Continuing to feed on what I call the devil's candy, which is addiction, my struggles continued, and in January 2017, once again, I selfishly attempted to end my life, this time with great consequences. Um, my wife, well, I got home from work on February 8th, and Child Protective Services was there. Uh, they, they removed my children from me, from the house, uh, told my wife, who, who was pregnant with my unborn son, that she needs to divorce me. So I was left in my home that night by myself. Due to the seriousness of the incident, I also put myself at danger of losing my job. I was being investigated by federal investigators, also by government psychologists in Berkeley due to me possessing a security clearance. Life meant nothing to me anymore. In March of 2017, after again wanting to end my life, against the will of my pleading mother who was in tears, who had fortunately hit all my medications, God finally spoke to me. This time I listened. He revealed to me to stop being all about me, to humble myself and to be a man, to take responsibility for all the chaos that I created in my, my family's life, those who loved me, what I had put them through. The next day, I fearfully and resistantly walked through those double doors over here, and I looked to my left, and immediately I was eye to eye with my lifelong friend, Andre Sanchez. He assured me that the first thing God would take, the first thing God will take from me is my anger and my anxiety. And being a non-believer, I looked at him like he was crazy. I said, yeah, right, whatever, man. <laughs> You're out of your mind. Because I felt like that for so long, just terrible about myself. So he prompted brothers to pray over me, and to my disbelief, uh, about two days later as I was driving to work one morning, I felt this peace, I just 
realize that I felt this freedom, I felt joy, I was happy for the first time, and I, I can't even remember when. And so, um, at 5 a.m. in the morning, Andre received a phone call from me, and I asked him, I go, he answered, he goes, hello, and I said, he's real, isn't he? And he was still half asleep, he says, who's real? I go, God, God's real, isn't he? And he goes, yeah, he's real. So, at that point, I realized God had a plan. I truly felt his never-ending love. For it states in Romans 6.14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under law but, not, but under grace. You're not under law but under grace. I gave my life to Jesus a week later and was water baptized in April 2017. Thank you. Facing many defeating events in the process of trying to get my children back and to reconcile my marriage, um, I finally had the Lord to lay my burdens upon. My mom, my dad, Andre, Ken, many other brothers and sisters supported me on this long journey, and I thank all of you for that. Through much prayer, faith, and God's love, after over a year, in February 2018, I was rewarded custody back of all my children. Thank you. I have been rebuilding my credibility at work and still possess my security clearance. Thank you, Jesus. Through my walk, in just a little over a year, after losing almost everything I had worked so hard for and everything I loved, I am back where I started, living with my mom and dad. It's great. <laughs> you know, but I, I have gained so much more with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Since being reunited with my children, I've been able to introduce them to Jesus Christ through the amazing children's and youth ministries, and they're all four here today. Along with this, my mom has become a pretty regular attender here at Bear Creek Church, too. And I am blessed with so many amazing brothers and sisters and such an amazing support group. Never have I been so rich. Blessed with the undeserving and never-ending support of the one true God, I have been redeemed. I am forgiven. As Ephesians 1, 7 states, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of the sins, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Thank you. And God bless. David, I'm proud of you, buddy. Good job. I'm proud of you. David, you're cherished by God. Don't ever forget that. But we need, we need to remember, not only are we cherished by God, we're also valuable. We're valued to God. Uh, the prodigal son thought that, forgot that, and we sometimes forget it as well. In this second story Jesus tells, he talks about a woman who had ten silver coins, and she lost one. It was valuable. And she went looking all over until she found that, that lost coin. And when Jesus told this story, the coins were Roman government coins, and they were real silver. And the image of Caesar was stamped on the coin, that, that, that image. And we need reminding that the image of God, the likeness of God, is on all of us. If you have children, the image of God is stamped on your child, on your son, and on your daughter on your grandson and on, on your granddaughter. The image of God is in them. Genesis 126 says that God created us in the image of God and his likeness. And that's so important. If you're married, your husband and your wife has the image of God on them. When you look at them, you should be thinking God's image, God's likeness is in them. It's all over them. It's stamped on them. They have that that. God-like character in them and on them. 
this uh, past couple of weeks, I had the chance to spend several days with the country director of Living Water International. And he is the country director for Kenya. And Kenya was a part of the British uh, Crown uh, colonies for, for many uh, decades. And uh, there was a big in, uh, English influence there in Kenya. And a lot of English names are used by people. And this guy's name was Jack Tone Aquilo. And I told him, man, Jack, there's a famous street named after you back where I live in California, you know, Jack Tone Road. And he just kind of chuckled. But I had a chance to be with him for several days, uh, driving around Kenya in his uh, Range Rover. And it was interesting because every morning we'd, we'd get going and he'd be in his car. And he travels a lot. He's rarely at home. And he'd uh, pick up his cell phone and he would call his wife and he would say, Good morning, my wife. This is your husband calling to remind you of my loyalty to you. And how are my children? In fact, uh, I probably need to start doing that to you, Janet. I'll call you every morning and, and, and tell you that. But um, that, uh, that was just his way of doing those kind of things. Well, that lost coin had the image of Caesar on it. And we need to remember that we have God's image and likeness on us. Now, by the way, I have some bad news to tell you that, you know, the coins we use here in the United States that are minted by the, by the U.S. Mint, like in a quarter, there's no silver in that quarter. There's no silver in your dime, and there's no silver in your nickel either. In fact, the metal that's in you, on your quarter, um, if you melted it down, it wouldn't be worth 25 cents. Uh, it doesn't really have any value. Now, in the old days, our coins had real silver in them. But that's long, long, long past. Well, because this coin that the woman had lost was of value, when she found it, she had great joy. In fact, she probably went to Hobby Lobby, and she got some crafty things that you buy there. And she probably went home and made some homemade decorative little cards, invite cards, and she addressed them to all of her girlfriends, and she mailed them out, and she said, my coin was lost. I'm having a party. Come and celebrate with me. Uh, that coin that was lost is now found, and we need to remember that when it comes to going down wrong roads and making wrong turns in life, that even when we do that, God cherishes us and God sees us as valuable. We have real value in God's eyes. But we need to remember a third point, which is this, that we are also very unique, that God made us special. When God made you, he threw away the mold. There's no one else like you. You have a unique fingerprint that only you have. You have a unique set of DNA structure in your, your body. And it's only been within the last 20 years that we've fully come to understand the details of the DNA structure that we all have. And all of our DNA is different. It's unique because we're, we're valuable. And sometimes we lose track of the fact that even though God loves the whole world, he also loves you and he cherishes you. And he sees you as valuable, and he sees you as unique because there's no one else quite like you. God did that. And when Jesus told this third story, he was remembering his audience. And that's why every time someone is up here teaching, we need to remind ourselves of who's in the audience. We have some people that are real devout believers. We have some people that are kind of just uh, lukewarm believers, and we have some people who are not believers. We have a very eclectic audience. Jesus knew his audience was made up of notorious sinners and religious people who had hard hearts. He understood that, and, and he knew that. And when he told this amazing story, the prodigal son, he knew that his audience would identify with one of the two brothers. That they would either identify with the prodigal son, who, you know, did the wild thing, and the older son, who kept all the Ten Commandments down to the minute detail, but had a hard heart and was lost as well. See, this father who had two sons, both sons were lost. One son knew he was lost, but the religious guy didn't. And so this 
young son wanted to, you know, you know the story. In fact, in English literature, the story of the prodigal son is called the greatest short story ever written. And this young son, you know, won his inheritance, and his father reluctantly gave him his inheritance early. And the kid went out and bought a Harley, and he went over to Las Vegas. While he was in Vegas, he blew the whole wad. He blew everything. And when he ran out of money, he probably sold his Harley and got some more money. And when that was gone, he found himself destitute. And the only job he could get was feeding the pigs. And while he was feeding pigs, he remembered his dad. He remembered his father's servants lived better than he was living. And so the prodigal son decided he would return home and ask for forgiveness and ask to be not a son, but just a servant in his dad's household. And we know the story. When the Bible tells us that when the father saw the son coming off in the distance, which tells us that the father was looking daily for the son's return. We don't know how long he waited. Was it a week? Was it a month? Was it years? We don't know. But he was waiting for the son's return. When the son returned, the Bible says the father ran towards the son. In fact, this is the only time in the whole Bible where God is pictured being in a hurry. He was running. And normally, God's never in a hurry, but he was in this one situation, running. And the Bible tells us he embraced his son. He kissed his son. And he threw a big party for his son and welcomed him back into the family. And we can all identify with one of the two brothers. Because the older brother stayed at home, kept the Ten Commandments, and was irritated when his younger brother came home and was given a party. And if you've never read this story, by, by all means, go, go and read it in, in detail. And we can all identify with one of the two brothers, either the one that went off and lived wildly or the one that stayed home and kept the Ten Commandments, but his heart was still hardened towards God the Father. And that's really where the answer lies. It's, it's in our heart. What is the condition of your heart? Because no matter who you are or what you've done or where you've gone, or what you've said. Jesus is ready to embrace you. He wants to come and wrap his arms around you. He comes running to you with open arms and says, come on back home. And if you're that legalistic person keeping all those commandments, but your heart is hard because the commandments won't soften your heart. They won't make you close to Jesus at all. It's, it's all about your heart condition, not about what you do or, or don't do. We need to remember that Jesus is ready to embrace you because he's obsessed with lost people. Whether you're lost in religion or lost in wild living, he is there to welcome you home. I want to be obsessed with the things that Jesus is obsessed with. And he's obsessed with lost people. And that's why the church must always be reaching out to lost people and welcome them home back to the Lord. Shortly after World War II, Europe, Eastern and Western Europe, was just devastated. The Nazi Germany had killed over six million Jews in gas chambers and burned their bodies in a dozen different death camps throughout Germany and, and Poland. And thousands and thousands of Americans and Britons and French and Italians and people from Holland and the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany and Denmark and Russia. Thousands and thousands had died during World War II. And there were a lot of children left as orphans. And so the Allied powers, particularly the United States, in trying to rebuild Europe, we set up a system of orphanages all across Europe to take care of these children whose parents had died in, in the war. And on one occasion, a, a man who was just emaciated uh, was walking into an orphanage holding the hand of a little girl. And he walked up to the receptionist and he said, this is our, our paperwork. He showed the receptionist their identification papers. And he said, uh, this is my little girl. I want to leave her here in the orphanage. And the receptionist said, well, is she your daughter? 
Is she your, your little girl? And the man said, yes, she, she's my daughter. And the receptionist said, well, I'm, I'm very sorry, sir, but we have a rule here. And the rule is that only children whose both parents are dead can come and live in our orphanage. And he said to her, he pleaded, he said, you know, I was in a, a concentration camp for many years. And physically, I'm, I'm just, I'm just decimated. I, I have tuberculosis and I don't have the health. I don't have any money to care for my little girl. Please t take my little girl. And the receptionist said, I'm, I'm very sorry, but we have rules and we can't take her because you're her father. And the man stood there and thought for a moment, and he said, do you mean to tell me that if I was dead, you would take my little girl into your orphanage, you would give her clean clothes, you would give her food, you would educate her and take care of her, and you would try to find a family that she could be adopted by? And the receptionist said, yes, yes, we would do that. And when the father heard that, he picked up his little girl in his arms, he wrapped his arms around her, and he kissed her, and then he set her down, and then he took her little hand and walked over to the receptionist and placed the little girl's hand in the receptionist's hand. He said, take my daughter. I'll take care of things. And he went outside and went down an alley, and he hung himself. And I think God looked down upon us and he saw that we were hopeless. He saw we were helpless. He saw we had no place to go. And he looked to the son, Jesus, and he said, Jesus, I want you to go down to the earth. I want you to die for the sins of all my people. And that's what Jesus did. He came to this earth. He died on the cross for all of our sins. And then Jesus takes our hand, and he puts our hand up into the hand of the Father. And when he does that, the Father is there, and he wants to care for you because the Father believes you are, you are precious. You're cherished by the Father. You're of great value to the Father, and you're unique. There's no one else like you to our Heavenly Father because we have a good, good Father who wants to help you when you run through the stop sign, when you go the wrong way, down the wrong way street. He wants to be there with you to help you and carry you, to give you love, to give you joy, to give you peace. If you don't know the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, don't leave today without knowing that. Make sure that's not just in your head, but it's also in your heart because you are precious to our Heavenly Father. Will you stand together with me, please? We're going to end our service like we do every Sunday here at Bear Creek. We're going to have a time of prayer. We're going to invite our leaders to come up here to the front at this time, please. And we want to pray for you. Maybe you need to put your hand in the hand of the Father today because you've never done that through Jesus Christ. And if you choose to do that, we invite you to please do that today. Or maybe you have a prayer need in your life. We all need prayer. I need prayer more than all of you guys do, believe me. And we all need prayer. And if you have a, a need for prayer, for, for healing, for a relationship, for your finances, for your job, for your family, whatever it is, don't leave today without letting us pray for you this morning. So we're going to have one last worship song, and let's do that in a spirit of worship and prayer in these closing moments together. Give myself away. I give myself away. So you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away. So you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away. So you can use me. Give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. Here I am. Here I stand. On my life is in your hand. Lord, I
that song really tells it all we just got to give ourselves away to God because when we do that God is more than able to carry you over that mountain to swim with you through troubled waters to walk you maybe through a fire God is there he's for you God wants to lift you up and he'll never let you down God has exactly what's right for exactly what's wrong in your life God wants to bless your life. He doesn't want, to, doesn't want to blast you. He's a heavenly Father. And we come to the Father through, through Jesus Christ. And Jesus puts our hand in the hand of our Father. And our Father walks with us. He loves us because we're cherished by Him. We're valuable to Him. And we're unique. He made us special. He made us for a purpose. And He wants us to live out and realize that purpose. So may the truth of God's word really penetrate your heart today so that you know how, how precious you are to God. And may you enjoy that, that close intimacy with the Father and be able to share that with others as well because God's priority is to reach lost people. Now that's why we're here. So thank you so much for being here today. Let me pray for you before we go. Father God, we thank you so much that you are a good God in heaven. Thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. And thank you you're here with us. And you want us to know how we are cherished by you, how valuable we are to you, and how unique we are because you've made us special. So, Lord, bless these special people today. As we begin a new week today, walk next to us, beside us throughout this week. May we know you're always with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Meet somebody new before you uh, leave today. Have a wonderful day.